Good morning, YouTube. Pastor Ed Backel from Warden Community Church. Uh, our church leadership has decided that we're going to uh, abstain from physically meeting together for the near future. Uh, however, today is Wednesday, and Wednesday is our Bible study day, and we thought it might be a good idea to uh, go ahead and have our Bible study. This is the same material that we would be uh, covering on Wednesday nights, which usually meets at 6 uh, o'clock in the evening. But I thought I would share it now, so that that way you might have a chance to uh, open your own Bibles, read along, uh, and study with me, and be able to pass this along to others. Uh, we happen to be in the study the book of Acts right now. We're in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is um, uh, about the deacon Stephen, who was um, seized by the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. Um, and this actually is kind of a long chapter, simply because Stephen is uh, covering most of the history of the people of Israel in order to make a point. And instead of reading through line by line, verse by verse, <coughs> and just wondering what it all means, I thought I would break it down a little bit into its component sections. Now, one of the things that uh, I want to challenge you to think about as we enter into this. Go, like I said, go get your Bible. We're looking at Acts chapter 7, uh, the first portion of the, of the chapter. As you're doing that, think about this question. If you had to defend in court your views on something that you cared about, how do you think people would respond to what you had to say? If you had to defend in court your views on something that you cared about, how do you think people would respond to what you had to say? Uh, hello, thank you for joining us. All right, so as we are looking at Acts chapter 1, we're going to break this down into nine sections. There, Stephen makes a speech to this ruling council, the Sanhedrin, that addresses Israel history. So let's break them down. The first section is in verses 1 and 2. Why is Stephen making this speech? So Acts chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 says, Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and fathers, take note of that, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Brothers and fathers, this the, the point why Stephen is making this speech is to remind the Sanhedrin, this ruling council, that they are all part of the same family of faith. And that this particular family of faith has a pattern, and he wants to point that pattern out. So here's the, the second step here, the second section. This starts off uh, the second half of verse 2 and goes through verse 8. <clears throat> the God of our Father, uh, the God of glory, excuse me, appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad you've joined. Um, we are in Acts chapter 7. Uh, we're at verse 3 right now, and uh, we'll be covering most of this chapter. Uh, we're looking at why Israel is, um, or I'm sorry, why the deacon Stephen is is being called to answer for his actions uh, before the Sanhedrin. So we'll pick it up at 7 verse 4. Abraham. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in, settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot on the ground. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, Your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated four hundred years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. 
Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, a friend just posted, your coughing makes me nervous. Well, I have a bit of schmutz in my throat. <coughs> and uh, I'm just going to take a sip and deal with that. All right, smart Alec, here we go. Why does Stephen feel a need to give a history lesson to um, the nation, uh, the nation's leaders? Well, in this speech to the court, Stephen is showing that progress and change in God's plan for his people was being made. And, and how is Abraham an example of this change? You see, God calls Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, the, the very specific call is in there, verses, I think, 1 through 4. And Abraham's faithful response to this call founded the nation of Israel, founded his family. And, and this idea is that, that God's people are really to be a family, whether we can physically meet together or not. We're still God's family. Now, let's keep going. Uh, we will look at verses 9 through 16 now. <coughs> because of the patriarchs. Uh, thank you for joining new people. Just letting you know that we are in uh, looking at Acts chapter 7. And we happen to be um, picking it up at verse 9 right now. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our fathers could not find food. <coughs> when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. And after this, Joseph sent his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and his fathers died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. So now we've just covered Acts chapter 7, verses 1 through 16. I, I believe this third section is talking about <coughs> how this move to Egypt uh, was a great change for Jacob's descendants. Now there's a whole lot of history here that presumably the leaders of the people of Israel, they know this. This is not any new information that Stephen is giving to them. He's covering previously known ground. And I, and I think that is to, to help them remember, that's right, this is who we are as a people. Um, Stephen reminds uh, the Sanhedrin that God puts Joseph in Egypt. He saves the whole family. But at this point, Israel is still just a small family. But it's not going to stay that way. Israel and his descendants... Um, Abraham, Joseph, and his descendants uh, grow into a great nation while they are in Israel. And I believe this leads us to the fourth section. I'm going to pick this up from chapter 7, verse 17, and look at verse 22. So let's take a look at that. 17. At the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people, our people, see, there's the family thing again. The number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. Then another king who knew nothing about Joseph became ruler of Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. And at that time, Moses was born and he was no ordinary child. For three months, he was cared for in his father's house. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him up as her own son. Verse 22, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So, how is God's delivering of this little child, Moses, an indicator of future plans? 
You see, God put Moses into Pharaoh's family, the, the oppressors, to save his own family, to save his own people, Israel. And frankly, um, I think that's something that, that's uh, helpful for us to remember right now as things seem to be uncertain. For Moses' mother, I'm sure she was very apprehensive, didn't know what was going to be happening, death and destruction all around her of, of children. And yet, God has a plan. The people who are enacting God's plan don't know all the steps, but God still has a plan. And it doesn't throw God off at all when seemingly catastrophic things happen. God put Moses just where he needed to be in order to accomplish just what needed to be accomplished. He has his own reason for doing this. In fact, uh, Stephen points this out to the Sanhedrin, uh, picking up at verse 23 and looking at uh, reading through verse 34. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm glad to see you guys are here. We are currently looking at Acts chapter 7. And uh, we are at, where did I say we're going to drop off? Um, verse 23. So let's read that together. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian, so he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought that his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue him, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were, fright who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Median, where he settled as a foreigner and had two sons. Uh, he fled to Midian. He didn't flee, flee to Median, the, the section in the middle of the highway. I'm sorry about that. All right, that takes us through verse 29. <clears throat> Let's keep going. We'll go through uh, 34. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight. He went over to look more closely. He heard the Lord's voice. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off your sandals. The place where you are standing is holy ground. I have indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. How does God use Moses for his own purposes? You see, God calls Moses to serve his captive people. The law hasn't been given yet. The interaction with Yahweh is all based on personal relationship. There is no list of do's or don'ts, really. Not at this time. So Moses is going to a captive people who are stuck in a no-win situation where they feel like they can't get out. They feel like they have no options. And Moses reminds them God still hears you. God is the great I am. He is the God of the present, not just the past, and not just the one who holds the future, but the one who is with us right now. Now here we are in Acts chapter 7, and Stephen is telling these uh, government rulers <coughs> uh, a, a history lesson, and I find myself reading about this history lesson in 2020 and greatly calmed by it because I realize that God still knows what he's doing. He has always known. So God is calling Moses to serve this captive people and to remind them that God is still with them. 
But the challenge here that Stephen gives to the Sanhedrin, he, he starts to turn a corner. Up to this point, you could listen to this speech and kind of have warm fuzzies. Oh, oh that's right, we're all God's children. And that's true. However, God's children don't always react well. Uh, let's pick it up at verse 35 and read through verse 42. Verse 35 of Acts chapter 7 through 42. I'll find it. Here we go. These numbers get smaller and smaller every year. It's scary. This is the same Moses whom they had rejected with the words, Who made you ruler and judge? He was sent by their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt, and he did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the desert. This is that Moses who told the Israelites, God will send a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the desert with our fathers and with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and he received living words to pass on to us. But our forefathers refused to obey him. Keep note of that. Instead, they rejected him, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, Make us gods who will go before us. And as for this fellow, Moses, who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. That was the time they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and held a celebration in honor of what their hands had made. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees with what is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of Moloch and the star of your god Raphan, the Israels you made, the Israels, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. <clears throat> How does Israel respond to God under Moses' leadership? They fought him every step of the way. It's not that the uh, the, the promised land was an impossibly long distance away. They, they wandered circles in the desert for 40 years, basically waiting for those who refused to trust God to die off. How does Israel respond to God under Moses' leadership in, in this section? Israel rejects Moses' leadership, even though he did miracles. In fact, Moses not only did miracles, but these people got to Moses so much that Moses himself stumbled and fell and was kept out of the promised land because he became just as frustrated as everyone else. I know this can be a frustrating time right now. We as a shared people are going through a lot of the same things and it's not easy. I understand that. I think the point that Stephen is reminding of the Sanhedrin and would be well for us to remember is that God leads in ways that we might not necessarily enjoy. We best not reject him. That's not a good plan. Uh, if you're just joining us, we are uh, looking at Acts chapter 7 and we'll pick it up at verse 43 and look at 43 to 47. Acts chapter 7, verse 43. <coughs> this is a quote uh, from the Old Testament. You have lifted up the shrine of Moloch. Moloch was a pagan god uh, to whom people would throw their newborn babies into the fire. Not a good guy. And the star of your god, Rephan, the idols you made to worship. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony with them in the desert. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor 
and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. Here's the thing I think it's really helpful for us to remember. From the tabernacle to the temple, the place of God's presence changed and progressed. Now, God says that <coughs> excuse me, that he doesn't dwell in houses built by human hands. And yet we feel this need to give God a special place. Um, churches, synagogues, mosques. Does God live in them? No. God's people are gathered together. Uh, in my own tradition, the Congregationalist tradition, especially more on the East Coast uh, than, than the West, we have this idea, we don't call our buildings churches because the people are the church. We call them meeting houses. Uh, I think that's a pretty neat idea. It's a place that the community can gather to meet, not just for religious instruction, not just for worship, although that's probably the main point, but that we can come together to be a gathered community. And here's the thing. While we are being currently told to practice social distancing, we can still be a gathered community. We can take intentional steps like this one, Facebook, by sharing uh, Snapchats and Instagrams and just picking up the phone and calling people. That's probably more old school, but still works. We could write letters. We could drop notes. We could make little crafts and send them to friends. These are ways that we can intentionally be God's people. The fact that I'm in a building which is dedicated to religious use doesn't mean everything is always religious for me. Israel has the tabernacle with them. They, they haul it around all through their wanderings. They finally get into the promised land, take it with them until they're able to build a temple. And what does the nation do? They ignore God's presence. They haul the stuff around, but they functionally ignore God's presence in the tabernacle. And that is what starts to get Stephen in trouble with the Sanhedrin. At this point, I think they're probably starting to grind their teeth. I think they're starting to realize, well, wait a minute, he, this is getting a little uh, close to home here. Let's take a look at 48, 49, and 50. 48, 49, and 50. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by men, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? God doesn't require people to gather in a church building to have church. We aren't having church. We are being church church. We are being the ecclesia, the, the ones who are called out. So as we come together virtually, uh, making phone calls, checking in on each other, we are still being God's people for one another. Stephen is showing that the temple isn't God's true dwelling place. He, in fact, he's pointing out that God isn't bound by man's structures. And then finally, Excuse me. The last uh, section that we're going to be looking at today, verses 51 to 53 of Acts chapter 7. How did Stephen compare the attitude of those in the Sanhedrin with that of God's people down through the centuries? Verse 51. Stephen doesn't hold back. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect, though angels have not obeyed it. Israel still rejects God's leading. 
Stephen gives the Sanhedrin this wonderful history lesson, helps them remember that they are supposed to be God's people, and then points out to them that they were still rejecting God's leading. I hope that's not the case for us today. Here are a few things I'd like you to think about as we close. If you were to review your life, would you like to rewrite your own personal history? What rituals or traditions hinder change and spiritual progress among believers in you? Maybe you're not the kind of person who wants to um, gather together with a congregation in a meeting house and sing hymns and spiritual songs and read scripture, but you sense God is around. Well, I'm not going to argue with you on that. God is around. God is everywhere. But in the same way that one charcoal briquette is intended to burn, you don't cook a steak with one briquette. You gather them all together, and then when there's uh, sufficient heat, then, then it's time for the barbecue. So let me just encourage you, even though right now we are practicing spirit, or, uh, uh, social distancing, don't practice spiritual distancing. Spiritually, come together with those who are following Christ. How can we learn from those who have gone on before us? What stiff-necked attitudes might prevent us from seeing what God wants us to see? This time right now seems to be quite a wake-up call. I pray that we all would be drawn closer to him and closer to each other in all of this. God's blessing to you as you study his word, as you draw closer to him, and as you reach out to other people and remind them that we're not alone. Blessings. We'll see you later.